Hello, and welcome to Mosaic, the ELCA's video magazine. I'm Eric Schaefer, filling in for John Bachman. And I'm Wyzetta Bullock. Today on Mosaic, we'll introduce you to young women in Florida who've given up crack cocaine and taken up Bible study. And you'll meet the new director and speaker for Lutheran Vespers, Pastor Larry Getty. But we begin in Southern California, where last January's earthquake caused severe damage to 13 ELCA congregations and left hundreds of Lutherans homeless. Mosaic joined Bishop Herbert Schulstrom as he visited the area shortly after the earthquake hit. It was the first Sunday after LA's devastating quake, and as Lutherans gathered for their worship service, they heard words of comfort from their bishop. So I, I come this morning as a symbol of the church, as a reminder to you that you're part of a family of more than 11,000 congregations who are upholding you in their giving and in their prayers this morning and in the coming weeks. Some 20 ELCA churches sustained damage in the quake, but in many cases, things looked fine from the outside. It's very deceptive. Uh, we went to some churches yesterday and this morning that uh, where the buildings are condemned and, and may in fact some of them need to be knocked down and yet you can hardly see any damage. All you see is a, a crack down along the wall and uh, unless you're a building expert, a structural engineer, you, you may not realize that, that the whole building uh, may fall down because of that, that crack. That's the case in Santa Monica. The church building is unusable, but members of St. Paul's gathered for worship Sunday morning just the same. I mean, it's just a wonderful uh, completion of a, of a circle here, or a renewal of, of a circle. When, when we started out as a congregation um, uh, almost 10, 11 years ago now, uh, we came to Regis Church. We were 40 families. Um, we were, had you know, no place to go. We'd been essentially holding services in one another's homes. And we came to Regis Church. We said, we need a place. You know, can we rent a little bit of room? And they said, well, we have a office, and here's our sanctuary. And for the next uh, five um, uh, years or so, uh, we were, we were uh, guests isn't quite the, the word. We were really sharers of, of St. Paul's Church. And as we got larger and larger, uh, and the church was still accommodating. And finally, um, we decided it was time for us to, to move out into a place of our own. So here now, we're in an opportunity to, to in turn, you know, turn around and, and help out St. Paul. So it's an absolutely wonderful moment, I think, for, for both of us. It was uh, very moving, uh, because at that point, um, we really needed a place. Uh, we were homeless as a congregation. And uh, it just seemed just right, too, because we've had such a long-term relationship as two congregations that it felt like, in a way, a second home had been opened up to us and uh, creative hospitality had been offered. Congregations aren't the only ones homeless from the quake. In Canoga Park, neighborhood residents camped out on the grounds of Resurrection Lutheran Church. Emergency supplies were available from several Lutheran social service sites in the area. Many of these people are homeless. Um, many are sleeping in, in parks and in cars. Um, many of them can't cook, so we're, we're trying to put in a different type of food than, uh, than we would ordinarily put in for people who, are, who have homes. On a normal day, we do 40, out, uh, 40 orders, 40 families. Uh, I believe the other day, they did 152 families. And that's in, I guess, uh, eight hour, seven hour period. So we were really kicking them out then. This emergency assistance comes through Interlutheran Disaster Response, a joint effort of the ELCA and the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. One of the things that happens is that we find very often there are ELCA churches and LCMS churches that are very close together geographically. And it just makes good sense that we pool our resources and be able to work collectively. And because these churches very often share a community, Part of our response is to that same community. And this way we can have a much more equitable distribution of our resources and really uh, respond in more of a holistic way. It, this is one of the least reached places for Christ in the whole United States. Less than 20% of the people here in this community where, where, where our churches are, um, are involved in, in, uh, you know, in uh, worshiping communities. And so this is a mission field uh, par excellence. And, and now, unfortunately, it's also a place that's been devastated for years to come. But 
those are opportunities, just like in the early church, to really reach out with that gospel and for folks to get on fire with the Holy Spirit. And as the church continues its work through agencies and word and sacrament ministry, the Holy Spirit works in the lives of individual people. It, first of all, raises many questions for those who are on the edge. And uh, the, the question about God becomes a foremost question for children and for uh, those adults whose relationship with the church has been marginal. For those whose life are steeped in the church, whose life are steeped in word and sacrament, uh, their faith is actually deepened and will share that it was because of their faith in God that they were able to look at this chaos in the faith and, and be able to overcome it, no matter how severe the devastation was. That faith is evident in the lives of one couple from St. Stephen's Lutheran Church. From the street, you would never guess that Bill and Sonia Spears' Victorian home was nearly destroyed in a 1971 earthquake. I, I guess I have a lot in this house, of course, personally, more than most people probably. I mean, you know, a house is a, something you buy and sell. In this case, I built it, so it's a little different. You know, so he, I'm a little says, more emotionally attached. He says that very it. modestly, really. He, he took the house down board by board and stored it for a year. He had all the parts. He had them color-coded and had them all marked. Uh, well, we want to understand that it's not myself alone now. I mean, it was a family. <laughs> it really was a family project, including her dad. So. Yeah. And then, so. then, it, then he built it back board by board and tried to be very, very uh, honest to the architecture and to the style, to the original design, has changed almost nothing so that there would be a legacy left. That legacy was threatened during January's quake, but their faith has remained unshaken. And the first thing, I, I reached down to find my glasses next to the bed, and um, the very first thing, this, this really reached out and grabbed me, this, this cross. It had been hanging up here, and it was over there, and, and it just went around my hand when I... Uh, was the first thing, first thing my hand touched. So, uh, God talked to us. <laughs> and, of course, we know that uh, we're secure that God, God will keep us in his, uh, in his love during these times, even though our hearts pound into pieces. <laughs> For the Spears, worship remains an important part of anchoring their faith. And so, um, I, I, I really needed to get there, and uh, I even had a hard time getting in the shower to get there, and just because I was angry, and I, but I knew I needed, um, I needed to hear God's word, I needed to sing songs of praise, I needed to be near the people to find out how they were, uh, our phones haven't worked, we didn't know how, how our friends were, um, I, I, needed, I needed them to hug me. <laughs> um, and I, I just needed, needed to be where I knew that uh, the people of God were together just for that moment. I uh, had on a pair of jeans and a sweatshirt, and uh, I cried for the first time in a week. I sat there and wept, and I knew I just needed to, I needed to really empty and, and to let God just really fill me again. Because, and I didn't know that. I didn't know I was empty. And uh, that's how was there. St. Stephen's is close to Bill's heart for another reason. He helped build this church. It, it's fixable and it's, it's, it, we, can, we can survive that. We survived the 71 on that building also, so, and, uh, and did very well. This time we didn't do too well, but uh, uh, so it's going to take uh, quite a bit of work to get that fixed. But for me, it was really just uh, continuity and, and being able to worship with everybody and and, uh, and see her friends, as she said, and uh, know uh, that we're not alone, really. We're all together. As the cleanup and the aftershocks go on, the Spears hope their faith will help strengthen others. We're glad to be alive in the Lord. You know, it's, um, I'm sure it's very comforting. I took some people through the house. I didn't know them uh, a couple of days ago, you know. And I knew they weren't in the Lord, and, and they, they're frightened, you know, and, and just seeing someone else calm in their home, and to see that they had the same kind of cracks and all, you know, and, and said, well, it didn't look so bad, you know. And, uh, 
And I think that's it. I, I think we have a certain amount of calm to share with people, and, and uh, that's certainly what what we would like we'd like to do, just even in our neighborhood. That's that's what we can do right now in our neighborhood. Lutherans in Southern California still need our prayers and financial support. You can help with donations to ELCA Domestic Disaster Response, P.O. Box 71764, Chicago, Illinois. 60694-1764. Please write California Earthquake on the memo line. For some of us, faith is tested by sudden and unexpected events like the California earthquake. But for others, the struggle creeps up slowly, privately, until it consumes one's very life. For several young women in Bradenton, Florida, the test is drug addiction. The refuge is Mary House. It's called free basin because the first couple of times it's free. Then it's just basin because you have to get it on your own. Nobody's going to give it to you. And, you know, you have to do all kind of sort of things to get it, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's where the point I had got. Queenie has been on drugs for 11 years. Like tens of thousands of others, she used crack cocaine as her drug of choice. It soon became an all-consuming habit. In the summer of 1993, Queenie turned herself in to the Bradenton, Florida police. From jail, she was released into the care of Mary Lou Mickey, director of Mary House. Mary House is an ELCA ministry for women recovering from drug addiction. It is supported in part by a grant from the women of the ELCA. The one night I had about $8 in my pocket and about two rocks. I smoked one, I gave one away. I told my mom, I said, well, Ma, I said, I'm gonna go turn myself into jail. I said, I need me some help, you know, because me and her, we were fighting. And they didn't nobody believe me, but I was dead serious, you know? So I went to the 7-Eleven and I knew it was a long time before breakfast. I sat in front of the 7-Eleven. I ate up $8 worth of food and everything. And then I went down to the police station and I gave him my stem and I said, I need help. The man said, what is this? I said, that's my crack stem. I said, I want to see somebody help me, please. Often as an alternative, or even as an extension of time spent in prison, women like Queenie have been turning to this ministry, which began as an outgrowth of a Bible study at Living Lord Lutheran Church in Bradenton. An addicted person, addiction, cocaine is the, the, the drug by choice, they will, um, it's hard to stay off of it. It's, it's, a, it's a killer. They, for a girl to get through three months, we praise her, we have a party for her. I may have chocolate cake for her, but she's, she's made it through three months. Um, this is a, a very important to her, that they can stay clean, that they live day for day. Mistakenly thought of as a big city problem, Crack cocaine has spread across America to smaller towns like Bradenton. One of this city's main thoroughfares, this part of 14th Street once attracted tourists and retirees. Today, prostitutes walk the streets in abundance, a visible symbol of underlying crime, violence, and despair. Reverend Paul Christ is the pastor of Living Lord Lutheran, a mission congregation that currently makes its home in a storefront. In the near future, Living Lord will move to a new building nearby. Ministry isn't something we're, is waiting to happen here until we get some new building. Ministry is something we do from the outset. Uh, we're not focused inward. We're trying to be focused outward. Otherwise, uh, we're not of much value to the people we say um, we have a message for, the message of the gospel, if it's simply a place where People only can find safe haven, but it also has to be a place that reaches out. The women who come to Mary House often come with few or no job skills. To help them develop skills, Mary House runs a greenhouse that provides training in nursery skills and helps defray operating costs. There's a lot of horticulture in Florida. It's a real good state for uh, any kind of background in horticulture. So hopefully I can learn something about it and use it in the uh, in the industry. They're responsible every week for transplanting up the plants that I bring, um, watering them on a daily basis, um, basic care, growing them onto a stage where they can be um, sold or 
uh, distributed to area churches for donations. But life at the Mary House isn't all a bed of roses. Agina Gianello is the resident manager at Mary House and works with the women on a full-time basis. They're going through withdrawals, their, their attitudes, they have, you know, one day they'll be really friendly and the next day, or the next minute, they, they might be throwing something across the room or angry. Um, so it's tough working with them, uh, you know, every day in the house on a one-to-one -one basis because you never know how, how they're going to act. In addition to job skills and a safe environment, residents at the Mary House receive professional counseling on a regular basis. Reverend Carl F. Troon, a recovering alcoholic himself, works with the women in groups and individually. I've shared their experience and I've, I've, I, I know what they're going through. And this is literal hell when you are controlled by a substance outside of yourself over which willpower does not cut anything. You know? So it's just a, uh, I think it's a, it's a you're, you're one up simply by having been there so that you know what people are going through and you can help them. It's in my heart, you know, I'm true with it. You know, there's no, there's no getting around helping yourself. You know what I'm saying? And this, this program, you know, just like today when I went to talk to my counselor, I was telling her, the Mary House along with OTC is the world, my world right about now. That's, that's what I revolve around right now because that's what I need. And she asked me, what would I do if I was to get out today or tomorrow? I don't know. I'm not ready for that yet. You know, I can't talk about tomorrow. I said, today, today I'm just going to work my program. My feeling is if we can just give these girls a chance, just give them the loving that they, they need and also the discipline that they need, you will find that they will eventually come around they will do well. There'll be times when you'll have fights. There'll be times when I want to walk in, I don't want to walk in this house. But then there's times when I can sit and hug each one of them. There are girls here that have done beautifully, and there's girls here that have walked out. And I wouldn't want to tell you the names they called me, but I do feel that we need a home like this in every, every city in the United States. Eric, in both of these stories, the earthquake and Mary House, the human need for community really strikes me, just how much we really need each other to get through the difficult times. And not only the difficult times, but the happy times and the dull, day-to-day -day times as well. The ELCA has one ministry that can be a personal help to you in the ups and downs of life. Lutheran Vespers is a half-hour radio program airing on many stations around the country. After more than 10 years on the air, Dr. Richard Jensen retired from Lutheran Vespers last year. On this mosaic, we'd like to introduce you to the new voice of Lutheran Vespers, Pastor Larry Getty. Lutheran Vespers has been part of my experience since I was a very young person. I can hardly remember a time when I haven't been able to hear Lutheran Vespers. I must tell you that I haven't always listened to Lutheran Vespers, but I have usually lived in a place where I could hear it. Pastor Larry Getty, that's Larry, not Lawrence, is the voice of Lutheran Vespers, the radio ministry of the ELCA. Born in rural Minnesota in what he calls a traditional Lutheran home, Larry Getty has stayed close to his roots. His father was a carpenter, his mother a homemaker, and later a secretary. But the real influence on Larry was his brother Palmer. I have one brother who, it turns out, is also a Lutheran pastor. He is 13 years older than I am. He started college when I started kindergarten. And uh, as a result, we were hardly ever at home together at the same time, but I always had an older brother in my uh, mind as an image, an idol, a mentor, someone that uh, I absolutely adored. And when he went to the seminary, it was only a matter of time until I began to face that same struggle myself. A lot of folks always assumed that I would go to the seminary just like my older brother went to the seminary. I managed to fight it for a long time. 
but uh, eventually knew that I would need to explore that call for my own life. And now, some 20 plus years later, here I am, uh, having followed in the same, uh, the same call that my brother did. We have three children. Our oldest daughter is a senior in college. She will be married next summer. Our son is a senior in high school. He will begin college next fall. And our youngest daughter is a freshman in high school. And yes, our children are certainly at the center of, of our life's activity. God has blessed us with children, uh, as all parents will say, of whom we are very proud. Larry Getty took over the leadership of Lutheran Vespers in the fall of 1993, following in the footsteps of some very well-known speakers. The ministry was founded by Pastor Harry Gregerson in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, as a local radio ministry. From there, it grew rapidly to include other stations in South Dakota, Minnesota, and the entire Upper Midwest. Pastor Conrad Thompson followed Harry Gregerson in the 1960s, and Dr. Richard Jensen was the ministry speaker from 1980 until 1993. Today, Lutheran Vespers is heard on 135 stations across the United States and Guam. At least two of the previous speakers have also been longtime personal dear friends of mine. And to be able to follow in the tracks that they have laid down is an enormous privilege for me personally. This call to do this ministry comes at a time in my life when I think that God has led me to a unique opportunity and a unique preparation. I can honestly say that I believe I have the best job in the whole ELCA. Communication, in the best sense of the word, is a two-way street. Broadcasting the gospel is only one part of the Lutheran Vespers ministry. Irene Stanglin and Dixie Miller work on Lutheran Vespers with Pastor Getty at the ELCA's Lutheran Center in Chicago. They spend much of their time corresponding with listeners through the mail or by telephone. Lutheran Vespers is an important ministry because it reaches people at the point of their need. Uh, some people are just looking for nurturing. Other people are really in a crisis situation. And a lot of the uh, sermons, even the music on Lutheran Vespers, becomes very meaningful to them in, in that particular point of life. Usually, the two-way street starts with a letter. They've heard our program, they'd like a transcript, and um, they may tell us a little bit about <clears throat> their crises that they're going through, or what it was that touched them about the sermon. And uh, so then we respond. Uh, we just don't send out a transcript. We try to add a little personal note if they've had a death, why we try to um, send them some, some comforting thoughts and, and materials. Travel is another important aspect of Pastor Getty's role as director of Lutheran Vespers. In fact, much of his time is spent on the road, greeting listeners, preaching, and encouraging support for the ministry. But in addition to the broadcast ministry, there is another side to the work that I do, and it is illustrated by my being able to be here today. I am able to be in the congregations of our church and with members of the congregations of our church who support this ministry. That is one of the great joys of my work and it is indeed a great joy to do that here today at Mount Olive Lutheran Church. I think our audience is diverse both in age and in geographic location. The program airs in 29 states and Guam. We hear from people of all ages, and we hear from people in all geographic locations from very, very small villages and uh, rural areas in our country to people from the largest uh, urban areas in the country as well. I don't think there's any other work that I could conceive of doing that I would rather do. This is a marvelous ministry. To be able to preach the gospel, to be able to meet people, to be in congregations as I uh, am often able to do, I have the best work imaginable and am thankful to God every day that I can do what I do and where I do it as well. The ministry has such a history and a history of wonderful evangelical 
witness and evangelical warmth. And now in this latter part of this century, to be able to be that voice on behalf of our church and that voice on behalf of the gospel in a world that needs to hear the word of God's love so desperately is, as my children would say, awesome. It is an awesome privilege and it's a wonderful opportunity. Lutheran Vespers also has a cassette ministry for use in nursing homes, prisons, or for individuals who don't receive the broadcast. If you'd like to know when the program is on in your area or to receive more information about the cassette ministry, please write Lutheran Vespers, 8765 West Higgins Road, Chicago, Illinois, 60631, or call 1-800-638-3522, extension 2967. Before we go, we'd like to thank all the Mosaic viewers who sent us videotapes from their Christmas pageants last December. We look forward to sharing part of those with you on our November-December edition. And that's it for this time. Thank you for joining us. I'm Eric Schaefer. And I'm Wyvetta Bullock. Be with us again next time, because this is Mosaic, and you're a part of it. <laughs>